Hi folks, and welcome to video number three. In the previous two videos, I talked about language learning in general and teaching strategies to help improve that. In video number one, I went over the reasons why we should focus on common vocabulary and pronunciation rather than grammar, why it's important to provide plenty of comprehensible input, and why we need to do our best to make what we do in class memorable. I also mentioned the need for both structure and variety in any teaching session. In video number two, I went into the practical steps you can take to achieve all of this, starting with establishing your authority and emphasising the active role the students need to take in their own learning. I also went into how to exploit the various different elements of everyday English in order to get the most out of the material. So if your memory of that is hazy, and it probably is, because we forget so much of what we read or hear, I suggest you go back and watch it again at some point. In this video, I want to start by looking at getting students through the Trinity College exam in spoken English, and how that should influence your approach. Firstly, does having to get your students through a Trinity College oral exam at the end of the course make your job easier or harder? Well, in my opinion, it makes it easier. If you think that sounds counterintuitive, let me explain. The four essential elements of language learning are exposure to the language, engagement with it, how memorable it is, and the learner's motivation. It's this last one, motivation, that the teacher has the least influence over. So any external motivating factors, such as an upcoming exam, can only be a good thing. However, that doesn't take away the added pressure of getting your students through the exam. On a short course with an exam at the end, your success as a teacher is defined by your student's performance in the exam. And while each student in your class only has to worry about one student's performance, you have to worry about 15 or however many students there are in your class. So there's certainly added pressure for the teacher. So up to now I've talked about the need to focus on vocabulary and pronunciation and not worry too much about grammar. But how should this approach change to give your students the best chance of being successful in the exam? Well, if you were preparing your students for a typical written exam based on grammar, you would have to change your approach completely. You would have to look at the kinds of exercises in the exam and give your students lots and lots of practice doing exactly those types of exercises. That would be very boring and wouldn't help their English very much, but it would help their performance in that particular type of exam. The good thing about the Trinity College exams in spoken English is that they're nothing like that. They are, as the name suggests, all about speaking and understanding spoken English, which means that all of the things I've suggested doing in the previous two videos are 100% relevant to that aim. If a large part of the exam is about understanding a native speaker, the best practice is lots of practice listening to native speakers, i.e. you or your colleagues, both inside and outside the classroom. Similarly, the best practice for a speaking exam is to do lots of speaking. Having said that, however, there are things you can do to give your students the best chance of passing. So the first thing you need to do is to understand how the Trinity exam format works. There are 12 grades in the Trinity College exam, and the most important thing is to make sure your students are entered for a grade that they can realistically pass. If you enter for grade 7 and you don't pass, you don't get a grade 6 or a grade 5, you just fail. So accurate initial assessment is very important. If a student is getting lots of comprehensible input and focusing on all the things I've mentioned, their English will definitely improve over a two-week period. However, language learning is a slow business, so if they're a grade 4 student when they arrive, they won't be a grade 7 student after two weeks. They will be a better grade 4 student, or possibly a grade 5 student. As the topics and grammar in everyday English are based on the Trinity College exam syllabus, the initial placement test results should indicate roughly which grade the student is at, and this can be confirmed later. As I've already said, there are 12 grades in the Trinity exam, and these are divided into four stages. Initial, which is grades 1 to 3. Elementary, which is grades 4 to 6. Intermediate, which is grades 7 to 9 and advanced, which is grades 10 to 12. 
Within each stage, the tasks are very similar. So this means that when you first test your students, you can decide which stage they are at and begin exam preparation. You don't have to decide on the exact grade until the day before the exam, which means you can assess your students' progress through the course before making your final decision. If you're new to the Trinity College exam, you may want to seek advice from your director of studies or colleagues before making that decision. In this video, I want to focus on the stages where most candidates tend to fall, which is elementary and intermediate. At the initial stage, the language is very basic and the exam lasts between five and seven minutes, and preparation for that is not difficult. At the other end of the scale, at advanced level, the exam lasts 25 minutes and demands a very high level of proficiency, so you're unlikely to see too many of those type of candidates. So let's look at the elementary stage first of all, which is grades 4, 5 and 6. At this level, the exam lasts just 10 minutes in total, and candidates have two main tasks. The first is to discuss a topic selected and prepared by the student and the second is to have a brief conversation around two topics selected at random by the examiner from a list which corresponds to the unit topics in everyday English. So for example, the topics on the list at grade four are holidays, shopping, school and work, hobbies and sports, food, and weekend and seasonal activities. These are the topics for units seven to 12 in everyday English level two. So if a student has been using that book, they should be able to hold a short conversation on two of those topics. That brings us to the topic selected by the student, and this is where much more preparation is required. The first thing to make clear to the students is that the topic they choose cannot be one of those on the list for the conversation phase. So for example, at grade four, a student cannot choose holidays or food as their topic for discussion. In choosing a topic, students should think about something they are genuinely interested in and which they feel confident talking about. Teenagers and young adults will need guidance in this. A student might choose football as their topic, but when asked about it in more detail, will probably find that they can't say anything very meaningful on the subject beyond naming their favourite team and players. At the other end of the spectrum, I remember one girl who chose to talk about a book she had read and enjoyed. I knew from previous classroom interaction that the girl's English was quite good, but when I asked her to tell me what the book was about, she had great difficulty explaining the plot of what was obviously a complicated story. I advised her to choose a different topic because the one she had chosen didn't allow her to demonstrate how good her English was. In fact, it made her appear less fluent than she actually was. So the ideal topic should have some personal relevance and should be one which the student has knowledge of and can convey easily. Ideally, everyone should have a topic which is personal to them and different from everyone else's. The examiner won't want to interview 15 candidates all talking about the same couple of topics. Once they've chosen the topic, they have to divide the topic into a number of sections with subheadings. Four sections at grade four, five sections at grade five, and six sections at grade six. The reason for this is to stop students preparing a text on the topic and then repeating it from beginning to end from memory. Instead, the examiner will take a topic and jump around from one subheading to another. So for example, if the topic is ice skating, the examiner might begin by asking how often the candidate goes ice skating and later ask when the candidate first started ice skating. Teachers should always warn students not to try and learn whole sentences or paragraphs by heart. It's very easy for an examiner to spot when a candidate is doing this, and the speaker's pronunciation and intonation tend to get worse as well, and phonology is one of the key areas they are marked on. The other important aspect of the topic phase of the exam is that the candidate has to ask the examiner at least one question about the topic. Once you know your students are using the right book for their stage of the exam, so they are covering the right conversation topics in class, all you need to focus on is the topic preparation. 
you should set aside half an hour of class time every day for students to work on this. Start by explaining the rubric of the exam and giving students time to brainstorm topics according to the criteria I've already mentioned. After this, go around the class to hear some of their ideas and ask them questions based on what they say in order to establish whether these are topics they will be able to talk about. This is best done as a whole class activity, as students can learn a lot from the feedback given to other students. The next stage is for students to flesh out their ideas and divide their topic into distinct areas and give them subheadings. Once they have done that, you need to go around the class individually and check their progress. At this stage, you need to interrupt them and ask, ask them for more details, forcing them to speak naturally instead of from their prepared script. At this stage, you can also rephrase their English. Inevitably, at this level, they will be translating sentences from their own language, and the result will sound stilted. It's not cheating to give this kind of help, but don't rewrite the whole thing. This kind of checking and testing should be an ongoing process, and you can put students in pairs to practice. When they have had a bit of practice like this and feel more confident, they can do it in front of the class. Some students might feel daunted by this, so as the teacher, it's your job to make sure they see this as a collaborative learning experience rather than a test. Delivering a presentation to the class does not reflect how the exam will go, but it gives everyone the chance to hear what their classmates are talking about, ask questions, and listen to your feedback. Besides the two tasks candidates have to do at this level, they're also supposed to have mastered the grammar indicated for their grade and to have mastered the grammar for all the previous grades. As with the topics in Everyday English, the grammar exercises in the books are also linked to the various stages of the Trinity College exam. So if the students struggle with those grammar exercises, you have to rethink the grade that they are being entered for. Having said that, I think it's very rare for students to fail on their grammar, so I certainly wouldn't advise making that the focus of your preparation for the exam. As with your teaching in general, you're much better focusing on pronunciation, intonation and vocabulary. Moving on to the intermediate stage and grades 7, 8 and 9, the exam lasts 15 minutes. As with the elementary stage, Candidates have to do the same kind of topic preparation and talk about two other topics. The difference is that during the topic phase, the candidate is expected to lead the discussion much more. There are no subheadings and no cues from the examiner. Rather than delivering a presentation, the candidate is expected to engage the examiner in a discussion of the topic. In addition to having more responsibility to drive the discussion of the topic, there is also an interactive phase at the intermediate stage. The examiner will introduce this phase by saying, for the next part, I'll tell you something. Then you have to ask me questions to find out more information. You need to keep the conversation going. After about four minutes, I'll end the conversation. Are you ready? Then the examiner will say something like this. It's my parents' 50th wedding anniversary soon, and my sisters and I want to organise something special, but we're not sure what. In this example, the student could start by asking questions such as, what are your parents' interests? Do they have a lot of friends? Are you thinking of a large event with lots of people? Or something small for your immediate family? Depending on the answers, more questions would follow, before the student makes suggestions such as, why don't you organise a surprise party? Have you thought about paying for them to go on a holiday? Or what about organising a weekend break in the town where they met? Obviously this type of exercise requires the student to not only understand what is being said, but to be able to think and react in a logical and natural way as well. There are many examples of these types of prompts available, and they can form the basis of useful speaking exercises in class, even if the students are not doing specific exam preparation. Now I talked about the need to establish your authority and be organised, and this is especially true in the exam situation. Your students need to feel confident that you can guide them through the exam. 
I said that you should set aside a daily timetable slot for exam preparation, like the slot here which I've labelled presentation preparation. At grades 4, 5 and 6, 30 to 45 minutes should be enough. At grades 7, 8 and 9, you'll probably need a bit longer because you have an extra task to prepare them for. You need to work out how many teaching days you have before the exam and set goals of what you want students to achieve at the end of each session. It's very important that you monitor everyone's progress with their preparation. It may be necessary to ask some students to do extra work outside class if they're falling behind with their topic pre preparation. Another important part of the exam preparation is the need to put everyone at their ease. Yes, everyone wants to pass, but it's important to keep things in perspective. It's a 10 or 15 minute exam, and if your students have been entered at the right grade and do a relatively small amount of preparation, they will pass. It's important to point out that it's not just what they do during the allocated timetable slot for exam preparation that will contribute to their success. All the other speaking, listening and pronunciation practice they do in class is equally important. At the end of each teaching session, it's a good idea to use the roundup slot to remind students of the topic that you covered during on that day, some of the key vocabulary, and some of the issues connected with that topic. Get students to make notes, because this will give them ideas for things to talk about if the examiner chooses that topic to talk about during the conversation phase of the exam. Again, it's important to emphasise that the students have to take responsibility for their own learning. It's your job to manage the class, cover the material in the book, provide the right kind of exam preparation, encourage your students, monitor their progress and give feedback. It's their responsibility to engage with the lessons, interact with you and their classmates and take notes in order to remember as much as possible and give themselves the best chance of passing the exam. So a typical teaching session would look like this. Start by briefly eliciting from the students what you covered on the previous day. Introduce the topic for today and use the exercises in the book to generate some discussion around the topic. Continue with the ongoing work on pronunciation. Continue with the ongoing exam preparation. Do one of the reading or listening exercises on British culture from the workbook. Round up with some key vocabulary and ideas from the topic covered earlier. After the break, get the students to do the topic-related crossword. Get them to write something interesting in their journal. Do a grammar exercise if you have time and if you feel it's worthwhile. And end the lesson with a language game using QuizWord. If you stick to this pattern, you will have plenty of material to use and your students will get into good study habits. Be aware of the need to balance speaking and writing activities though. Writing is a good activity because it helps us remember, but restrict it to short bursts in class, otherwise it can easily become dead time where the students are not doing very much. When you set a writing exercise, set a time limit. The same goes for journal writing. Say something like, you have 20 minutes to write 10 lines. As long as you keep the students engaged by varying the activities and insist they speak English, they will improve. The other benefit of sticking closely to this kind of timetable and using the material in the books is that it will considerably cut down the amount of lesson preparation you have to do. And this is essential because teaching is a demanding business. It's all very well coming up with a wonderfully creative activity which takes up half the morning, but you can't do that day in, day out. You need a workable formula which benefits the students and is relatively easy to deliver. Once you've established this pattern, you can add uh, other one-off activities as you see fit. Now I've used this system on summer courses with and without Trinity College exams and I know it works. One feature of it that is particularly useful is QuizWord, but it's also something that I've noticed has been underused in the past, so I want to spend a couple of minutes explaining why you should get into the habit of using it regularly. First of all, what is QuizWord? Well, it's a set of 200 cards, each containing six questions in different categories, so a total of 1,200 questions. There are 100 blue cards 
and 100 red cards, so you can alternate to avoid repetition. Although, as I'll explain in just a minute, repetition is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, that in itself would be a very useful resource. But what makes QuizWord even better is that those 1,200 questions only use 2,000 of the most common 2,500 words in the English language. If my many years of language learning and teaching have taught me anything, it's that we learn better when we're interested and engaged. And nothing works better than a fun activity which engages students so much that they forget they're actually in a language class. Games and quizzes are what we do as native speakers for amusement, and as we all know, they're like gold dust in the language classroom. Of course, not all games are good for language learning. Some can quickly become repetitive and boring, or may not really practice the student's language skills very much, such as hangman or word searches. And general knowledge quizzes need to be carefully planned because general knowledge is very culture specific. One American's answer to the question, what nationality was Picasso, was Mexican, which would amaze most Europeans. Similarly, British people would struggle to answer questions about baseball, American football, or American geography or history, and we share a language and a great deal of history and culture. The best games are ones that can be used in any teaching situation, don't involve lots of preparation or materials, involve speaking and listening more than reading and writing, are unpredictable and make students think, practice useful language, and can be used over and over again with students of any level. QuizWord ticks all of these boxes. I first became aware of the logic of focusing on high-frequency vocabulary in the late 80s when the Collins Co-Build English course by Dave and Jane Willis was published. Its lexical syllabus was based on computer analysis of the patterns of use of millions of words of modern English. But the importance of learning common vocabulary had been highlighted over 60 years earlier. Way back in the 1920s, Harold Palmer, a pioneer in the field of English language learning and teaching, and widely considered to be the father of applied linguistics, recognised that the way to achieve conversational proficiency was to memorise perfectly the largest number of common and useful word groups. The great advantage we have now is access to better data in this field, so we have a much better understanding of which words are the most common and therefore the most useful. They are highlighted in any good learner dictionary. But having access to this information is only half the battle. From studies of how memory works, we know that trying to learn lists of words out of context is unlikely to be very successful. We simply forget words which have no meaningful context to anchor them in our memory. What QuizWord does is provide the learner with both the most common words and a context. Where memory is concerned, studies show that the best technique for counteracting the natural tendency to forget things is spaced repetition, a reason to use QuizWord over and over again in class. So with the set of QuizWord questions, you've got the perfect English language teaching resource in your bag and no preparation necessary. But how do you use it? Well, there are lots of possibilities which would take some time to explain, so I've put them on a PDF which you can download. Just click on the link in the comments below. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching.